Good morning, Canyon Hills. To all the men, I want to say happy Father's Day. Can we give them a hand? I want to welcome everybody here this morning and everybody across the street at the summit, those joining us online. Today's a great day. I am so glad to be in the house of the Lord. How about you? Amen. So thankful to be home because last week at this exact moment, we were being detained by law enforcement. Well, I say we because Renee and I are married and we're one. It was actually more she when I say we. <laughs> and so last week we were out of town. We were in Oklahoma because it was going to, it was the dedication. We were there for the dedication of our new grandbaby, just a little beautiful baby. And we got there and, uh, and so we were getting ready and all the hassle of getting ready. How many of you know when you're, you're dealing with children and everything, there's a lot there. Easy to forget something, easy to leave something behind. We get to the church, we're unloading. As we're getting out, we realize, of course, Evelyn has this special little outfit on, the dedication outfit. She has everything, but missing is the ornamental bow that goes in her hair. How many moms know you have to have the bow? These are going to be pictures that last in infamy, right? We'll be looking at this years from now. And so Renee steps up to the plate. I know exactly where that bow is. I'll go home and I'll get it. She jumps in the car, starts the engine, peels out of the church parking lot. It's okay, it was a Pentecostal church. There she goes down the street. I mean flying down the road. She gets the bow. She is racing back to church. She knows the dedication is going to be very early in the service. And as she is racing back to the church, she hears, Woo! Would you pull the car over? They pull her to the side. They detain her. And she gives them the most repentant, sweet look, and they totally let her off the hook. <laughs> I just want to say on Father's Day, if that had been me, I'd been going down, okay? <laughs> We're hauling you in, pal. And I told Renee, crime doesn't pay. <laughs> so she is, uh, she's doing better today in the house of the Lord. We were with our grandkids uh, the last week or so. And so, uh, you know, what I remember from this is a, a, a little fact, a, a little medical fact that, that insanity is hereditary. How many know that? Right? <laughs> Parents inherit it from their children <laughs> and their grandchildren. Can I hear an amen? Right? I mean, I'm telling you what, we were doing everything under the sun. It takes a lot of entertainment to keep small children, you know, going. And you got to keep the, when your grandpa and Nana, you got to keep the magic going. You don't just see them every day, right? So we're pulling every trick out of the bag, trying to keep this entertaining. And, and one of the things we get during the week is a, a Yahtzee game set. Yeah. And so, so those kids, these little kids don't even know about Yahtzee, but we're going to teach them because Yahtzee, you can do a whole bunch of times and it's free. And so we get the Yahtzee going, it's got the little container, and you roll the dice, and man, it makes noise. How many of you know kids love noise? And pretty soon, you know, within a couple of hours, we have a rule that Yahtzee can only be played out on the back patio. <laughs> and so Renee and the kids are out there, and they're playing, and you know, here they are just, just rolling the dice, and they're all excited, and it's bouncing on the table, and pretty soon the kids throw a wild roll, and the dice bounce bounce off and they're in, they bounce off onto the patio. And so Renee gets up, she's looking around for the dice. She, she finds one of them, gets them back, and now she's got almost the whole set. There's, there's one missing, she's looking around. Now the kids are concerned. Kids are like, Nana, Nana, there's a dice missing. Nana, you gotta find the dice. And so she's looking, pretty soon after about 20 minutes, she's like, I have looked everywhere. She comes inside. She starts recruiting people. You've got to come outside. She's the Nana. She's going to find this, this dice. And so uh, one by one, every person in the house goes out on the back patio looking for this. Hours go by. After a few hours, I realize they need some adult supervision here, okay? I step in. 
I go to the Yahtzee container. I said, let me see, the, see those dice. And I look, and next, next to it, there's a, now an additional little dice. And Renee was so obsessed, she wasn't going to let it fail. She drives to the store and buys a, a board game that has a dice on it because she's going to take that dice and put it back in. She's going to fix the situation. I said, what is going on here? I said, who found the dice? She said, I didn't find the dice. That's a little dice. I bought it at the store. I didn't know it was small. I, I said, well, who found the dice? She said, we didn't find the dice. I said, she said, there's still one missing. I said, there's only five dice in Yahtzee. <laughs> and our grandson thought there were six. That whole search, the whole time, there was never a dice missing. <laughs> Insanity is inherited. Can I hear an amen? Hey, I want to show you a picture of my little granddaughter here. If you can see her, she's got her bow on here. Oh, she's praising the Lord and working on her oaky accent. Isn't that great? Hey, we're going to jump in and pick up where we left off last week. We are in this series on the book of Acts called, titled, To Be Continued. And uh, as we are in this, last week we left off, we started the second missionary journey. We're in, we were in Acts chapter 16. And when you look at this map, we'll put up this map, we want to just retrace where we've been. This, remember that this missionary journey started in the city of Antioch. Remember that at the beginning, Paul and Barnabas, who had been on the first missionary journey, had a falling out. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark on the second missionary journey. Paul said, no way, he abandoned us before. And so now it's Paul and Silas on this second missionary journey. Barnabas and John Mark are going to the island of Cyprus. So they head to the towns. They revisit the towns that they had been to before, Derby and Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. And they, they go over. They try and go up into Bithynia. But while they're at Alexander Troas, Paul has a dream. He sees a man over in Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. He knows this is a spirit-filled dream. How many of you know the Lord can speak to us in dreams, amen? He knows this is from the Lord. They immediately get up. They go across the water, as you can see on, on the map. They go across the water. They land in Neapolis, and they go to Philippi, and that's where they were last week. And you'll remember they met Lydia by the, by the stream, meaning there was no Jewish synagogue. There were no believers in, in that town. And they, they meet with her, they talk, and as the ministry continues, the Apostle Paul uh, cast out a demon from a young, a young girl, and because she had been uh, helpful in, in, in uh, uh, making money for some people, the people got mad, they arrested Paul, and, and, and uh, they put Paul and Silas in jail, we know the story, they beat them, in the midnight hour, they were in stocks and bonds, and, and they were singing praises to the Lord. How many of you know in our worst day, we can sing praises to God. There is power because God inhabits the praises of his people. The, 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 the jail cell shakes, the bonds are broken, the apostle Paul and Silas are free, the jailer comes in, he gets saved, and, uh, and it's just an incredible story. I love the story of of what God did in Philippi. The next day, the jailer tells them, the magistrates have decided that you can go. You can leave and go home. And I love what the apostle Paul says. No, they beat us publicly. They imprisoned us publicly. Tell them, let them come and walk us out of here. Don't you love that attitude? It's a little bit of pushback, right? Because they're Roman citizens and they know the law has been broken. How many of you know just because you're a believer doesn't mean you give up your legal rights? Can I hear an amen? amen. Right? We've got to remember that. The rule is not just be nice. You have to stand for what's, what's right. The apostle Paul push, pushes back and they come and they escort him out of the city. And now we're picking it up. We're picking up where, where they move on to the next town of Thessalonica. And today, as you look at the map, we're going to visit these three towns, Thessalonica, Berea, and then we're going to go down to Athens. And what we're focusing on today, we're going to cover a very important passage, Acts chapter 17, which is a, a famous passage of Scripture because Acts 17 is one of the greatest uh, explanations of the gospel to the secular mindset. It's 
viewed as one of the Apostle Paul's greatest sermons of all time. And we're going to look at this, and really this is a tale of three cities, a tale of three different groups and how they responded to the gospel, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. Could you say those three names with me? Thessalonica, Berea, Athens. And so, so this, this city of Thessalonica was really, it was the next city they were going to. It wasn't that far from Philippi. And so as they go there, it's a major port city. There's a huge bay there. It's the second biggest city in Greece. It's about 200,000 people, which in that day was a very large city. But what's most important about Thessalonica is it's right on the Ignatian Highway. And this is the major highway in the Roman Empire that connects east and west. And what this identifies is the strategic nature of this city because remember the gospel has now just come to Europe. And if the gospel lands in Thessalonica on this major highway where people cross through, the gospel is going to spread all the way to Rome. It's a very big deal. And so this is a strategic time. It's an important time. Thessalonica was an a major business city. It was a place where industry was taking place. It's where shipping and all these different things took place. It was an important touch point on the map. And God was going to plant the word of God in this major city. God puts churches in cities to redeem those cities. Can I hear an amen, right? How many believe that God put Canyon Hills in this city, this town would be redeemed, amen? Amen. I want to tell you, I am thankful for every one of the churches in this town preaching the word of God, going out, ministering. How many of you know Bakersfield would be a different kind of city if it weren't for the churches? And this is what is happening. Let's pick it up now. We'll jump in verse 1, chapter 17, Acts, as we jump into this story. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this is Jesus whom I preach to you. This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. What you see in Thessalonica is that this, this was a place that while, uh, while the Apostle Paul was not necessarily there a long time, God did a major work. When you look at verse 2, what you see is it's very likely they were only there for three weeks. The Apostle Paul was only in this town for three weeks, but yet when you look at the story of the church at Thessalonica, it's a major story. The very first the very first letters written to churches by, by the Apostle Paul was to Thessalonica. What you see when you read those letters is though he was only there a few weeks, he had already gone deep in Bible doctrine. They were aware of the rapture of the church. They were aware of the, of, of the, uh, the future, the return of the Lord. Thessalonica only had him for a short time, but yet he did something God did something incredible. Look at verse three. It says, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer. Now remember, he's in a Jewish synagogue. This was the issue with Jews. Jews viewed that when the Messiah would come, he would be a conquering king. It was a major mental hurdle. They viewed that he was going to come and free them from Rome. They viewed that he would be reigning and ruling but they overlooked passages like Isaiah 53 that talked about the suffering servant, that talked about how the Messiah would come and he would die. They overlooked all these things. And so the Apostle Paul was meeting them at their point of understanding. And he was saying, you were looking for a Messiah that would be a king. But look in verse three, he was demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. When the Apostle Paul shared in this It opened some of their eyes and they were were able to to move forward and they received the Lord. Look at verse five. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious and took some of the evil men from the marketplace 
and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So now the, these agitators, people who are envious, they're seeing that the Apostle Paul, there's a new following the people in the town who feel like they're losing influence, they begin to accuse Paul of social upheaval. He's promoting another king. They arrest the person who he's living with, that's, that he's been having the meetings uh, with. They take him in. And I love this in verse six, this phrase, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. You know what, this is the amazing thing. How many of you think this was having an impact on their city? Absolutely. It was turning. They said, these are the guys that are turning the world upside down. Hey, I want to tell you something. I believe the church today is turning the world upside down. But when we're turning the world upside down, we are actually turning it right side up. You know what I'm talking about? How many of you know we live in a world that is upside down already? A world that is so confused that they don't even understand the most basic concepts of truth. A world that, that is believing in sanity right now. A world that has been reinvented in our culture just in the last few years, changing the entire uh, view of what we believe, of what we stand for. And when the gospel comes to a town, it impacts a town, and when it turns it, it turns it right side up for the glory of God. And God does that. He turns towns upside down. He turns churches upside down. He turns people upside down. How many are ready to be turned around for the, by the power of God? Amen? Amen? And this is what happened in Thessalonica. The Jews and Thessalonica became jealous and convinced, convinced that they were losing influence. And so they caused this riot. Everywhere Paul would go, there'd be a riot or a revival. Isn't that awesome? That's a good sign. That's a good sign. They could not ignore, ignore what happened. So when we look at the church at Thessalonica, what we see here is that it was not instant results. So, so what happened is, after just three weeks, the Apostle Paul got ran out of town. Now that does not look, how many would agree that does not look like a big success, right? You preach three weeks, you were run out of town, it looked like a big failure in the short term. And you know what? This is what happens. See, when you speak forth the gospel, sometimes it looks like they did not receive it. Sometimes it looks like a failed effort. Sometimes it's easy to look at it and be discouraged. But I want you to know the word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And they can run, but they can't hide from the truth of God's word. As so many of them, the Holy Spirit is bringing it back to them over and over and over again. And you may be thinking right now, I shared my faith with them. It was a total loss. I made a full of myself. It was a failure. That may be the short-term results, but the eternal results you will know in heaven. And when we look in the New Testament, though the Apostle Paul was only there, Paul and Silas, three weeks, Thessalonica is viewed as one of the ideal churches in the New Testament. One of the most fervent, one of the most passionate, one of the ones looking for the Lord's return because the short-term results, results are not what we're looking for. We are looking for eternal results for the glory of God, amen? How many believe in for your whole family to come to Jesus, amen? That's right. So this first example, what we learned from the church in Thessalonica is that it may look like a failure short term and it may be one of your greatest successes. One of your greatest successes. Now we go to the town of Berea and we look here in verse 10. Because of this, because of this riot, because of what was taking place, 
they, they believed the way to calm it down, the apostle Paul and them needed to go. And look in verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. This verse 11 is one of the most powerful verses. If you have not marked this in your Bible, you want to mark this because this is the sign of a believer whose life is going to be transformed. The Berean church was, was uh, categorized as being more fair-minded, some of your translations will say more noble-minded, people of better character because they received the teaching but they compared it to God's word. And the lesson we learn in this is this, no matter where you are, when you hear the word of God spoken, how many of you know it is your responsibility to look and see, is that in God's word? So when you go home on Sunday, you can take the notes, you can go over the passage, you can review it, and you compare it and see. And the Bereans were people who had this character. They tested what Paul said against the gospel. And this is what we, we test all things against, the practice of testing what is spoken against what God's word says. We trust but verify. Did I hear an amen, right? I believe it, and I'm going to check it out in my Bible when I get home, right? I see some of you at times looking things up on your phone during service. I know you're not shopping. I, I know that. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, look at that little Berean. And I hear a sound, you've got mail. See, culturally, it's so easy to put trust in some image, to put, oh man, like worst timing ever, Terry. <laughs> worst timing. Okay, I just want to say, even on Father's Day, you're pushing it, pal, okay? <laughs> I'm sure that was Christian music. I'm sure... It's easy for us to get our eyes on people and follow people. It's easy for us to, to, to test things against how it feels to us. Where we say, that doesn't feel right. That, that, that feels, it feels so good. I just think, I just feel it. How about this? Testing things against miraculous signs and wonders. How many of you know that's not the biblical standard? Can I hear an amen, right? What do we test things against? The word of God. One thing. Does it line up with what God's word to say? And I just want to speak a blessing on every Bible preaching church in Bakersfield, California, proclaiming the powerful, life-changing word of God. It will not return void. So this is what we learn from the, the church in Berea is that we have to test against this. And this looked like a win, and it was a win. We have to measure all things against God's word. Look with me in verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Paul, Silas, and Timothy remained there. Interesting point. How many of you know churches aren't planted by individuals? They're planted by teams of people. I want to say thank you to every person in Canyon Hills who said at one time, I'm going to help some of these churches in our community that are run down to be strong again. The Lord bless you, right? Teams of people. And Silas and Timothy stayed there in Berea while Paul was sent away. Now imagine this. This distance between Thessalonica and Berea was about 50 miles. Those people came 50 miles in that day. That was a little bit of a haul. 
And they came 50 miles to stir up the crowd. They so disliked the Apostle Paul. How many of you think he made an impression on them, right? Okay. And so they, they ran him out of town. And this is the thing. The gospel is a divider. It divides between false and truth. It divides between the truth and a lie. Satan is never happy when people find Jesus. And you've seen some of this. Times we've done revivals. Remember the revival we did last year downtown in the big tent. And we saw all types of different things taking place because people were getting saved. People on drugs were walking to the altar and setting their bag of drugs on the stage. I'm giving it up for Jesus. I'm clean. I've received the Lord as my Savior. Let me tell you something. Yeah, that's the power of the gospel. <clears throat> How many think there's a very unhappy drug dealer on the other side of that transaction, right? Okay, so it divided. One person's life was transformed, but that drug dealer is now, I am going to cause trouble for them. And this is what happens when we boldly declare the faith the devil's crowd gets upset. They don't like it. And all throughout the Bible, you see this, that God's people, when they boldly declare God's word, they face persecution. They face persecution. They face ridicule. They face mockery. Think about Noah building the ark all those years and every day. People say, Noah, what are you going to do with an ark? There's no water around, right? Right? All those years he was mocked, he was laughed at. Think about different people who have faced persecution because they stood on God's word. You think of stories like the three Hebrew children who ended up going into the fiery furnace because they would not bow their knee to the current philosophy. How many of you know in those moments, God shows up in a powerful way, right? He's the fourth man in the fire. And so we learn from, from this church of Berea that we compare all things, we, all teaching to God's word, and we see what God does when we, uh, when we hold to his words. Verse 15, look with me. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him, with all speed they departed. And now Paul arrives at Athens. Athens is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I wish you could see it right now on the screen. <laughs> it's like one of those subtle cues, right? Now we had this all worked out in advance, trust me. If you've been to Athens, you know it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. It is incredible. In the very heart of this town, this hill that rises 500 feet up, this town that was built against that hill as a strategic position. The Acropolis, one of the architectural wonders of the world, built 400 years before Jesus, rest on top of that hill, no place higher in the city. Athens was the center of culture, the center of education. The temple on top of this Acropolis was dedicated to the goddess of Athena, the goddess of wisdom. One of the greatest universities in the Roman Empire was here in Athens. And Paul now is in this town, and he knows the history here, that out of this town came Plato and Socrates and, and Aristotle. Out of this town, it was, the, it was the birthplace of democracy. It's influenced the world. But this town... They had peaked hundreds of years before in the golden age, maybe 500 years before. Was, at that time, would have had about a quarter million people, but in this day, it had shrunk dramatically as far as population. It used to be a great, a great military power, but now it was just a seat of culture. The Romans had come in in 146, and they had taken over, but they loved all things Greek. So they made it a free state, they made it a free city, a federated city, and they allowed it to keep on continuing just like it had. 
and this beautiful place, this beautiful place, the Apostle Paul is walking through. And even to this day, when you walk through Athens, there, there are one after another beautiful sites that were there in the first century, all throughout the city. But it was a city that was overrun with idols. One historian said, you were more likely to meet a God in Athens than a man. And what he was saying was this, that there were more idols and altars to idols in Athens than the total population of the town. That when you would walk down the streets, you'd see these very ornate altars because it was a polytheistic culture and they didn't want to offend anybody. See, their belief is everybody has a different view of the truth and we've got to let them speak their truth. Does that sound familiar to you at all? <laughs> Tolerance was more important than truth. It was a time where people loved the new, the novel. They liked what the latest thing was. That's what they'd be talking about. Any news hounds here? Right? You love the latest story, right? Every day, your conversation is based on, did you hear what Trump said? Did you hear what Biden tried to say? Here's another thing. If you went in Athens and you talked to people, they would consider themselves very spiritual. Do you know anybody like that? Oh, I'm not religious, but I'm a very spiritual person. Ooh, I know what spirit you got in you, man. <laughs> and so this town totally given over to idols. Every public building in Athens was dedicated to a God. And what happened is people were confused about which God to worship, so they just worshiped them all. They didn't want to offend anybody. And the idols allowed Athenians to live lifestyles that they wanted to pursue. So if you lived in Athens and you wanted to get drunk, you would go to the temple of Bacchus. And they would be drinking and they would, they would do all the things that went with that because that was worshiping the god Bacchus. If you were wanting to have a sexual experience, you would go to the temple of Aphrodite, the, the goddess of love. If you were wanting to, to experience real savagery or a hostile, combative situation, you would go to the temple of Zeus and worship Zeus. And that is how it was. Each of these Idols, these temples, enabled a lifestyle that people wanted to live. And it's the same way today. We don't call them temples anymore, right? You see the little symbol? It's the month of June, and you see a rainbow symbol outside a store. How many of you know it's very likely not talking about the rainbow of Noah? Right? Right? You see a sticker with bunny ears, okay? That's probably not a pet shop. That's Playboy. How many of you know what I mean, right? <laughs> Those symbols are still today. See, we just don't call them temples. How many of you know we live in a nation that is full of idolatry? Whether it is our movie stars that we look up to or influencers or, or some musical person that we look to, it is an idolatry where we put people in the place of God. And when the apostle Paul came into Athens and he saw all the beauty, he saw all the beauty, the Acropolis and the ocean and all the things, he was not caught up in that. He saw the spiritual depravity that was there. And this is what I want to ask you. What is it that you see when you look at people? Do you judge them by their clothes, by the house that they live in or the car that they drive? Do you assess who they are based on their occupation? That you look at them, you say, well, they're in this position. They're very, they're very influential. If they're an official or whatever, or do you look beyond the veneer and see the condition of their soul? You see the spiritual condition. I want to tell you, when I drive into the areas, 
filled with homelessness, filled with people who have been through abuse. I want you to know that's not just a physical reality. It is a spiritual reality. There is a stronghold there that God wants to tear down. And the Apostle Paul looked beyond all the beauty of Athens, and he saw something that needed to be taken care of. The Apostle Paul was waiting. He was waiting for Silas and Timothy to come come back from Berea. And so he's kind of on a little vacay. I'm just going to go and kick back in Athens. How many would like to have a couple days in Athens? Yeah, can I hear a name here? Bakersfield Summer. But here's what we see. Paul, Paul was used by God even though he was on vacation, okay? Something stirred up in him. He's supposed to be waiting for his team to arrive, but I just can't help it. I see all these people lost. He looked at these idols and he knew that there's gonna be broken hearts at the end of these idols because those are false gods that are not going to fulfill their needs. And he knew there's something spiritually that needs to happen. I have the answer and I cannot be silent. And the, the apostle Paul spoke out. He spoke because he was provoked. When do you share your witness When do you share the gospel of Jesus Christ to your neighbor, to your loved one, to your family member? There should be something that when you're visiting with them, the spirit of God in you begins to stir up. This word for provoke literally means like an epileptic seizure. I can't can't stop myself. I've got to share the good news. I cannot let them continue in this situation without speaking up out of love. Look at verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was, say it with me, provoked. Provoked within him. And when he saw that the city was given over to idols, therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. They happened to be there. So The Apostle Paul's response, he sees the idols, he sees the depravity, he sees beyond the beauty of Athens, and he sees the spiritual condition. And how does he respond? Look with me. What is the first word in verse 17? Say it with me. Whenever there is a therefore, you ask, what is it? What is it there for? There's some deep theology going on in this place, man. It's powerful. It's going to sneak up on you about noon. So it's connecting this first word in verse 17. It's connecting his response. What is he going to do? Therefore, he gathered together a group to have a political statement parade. Therefore, he pitched tents along the Acropolis and set up a camp to demonstrate Therefore, what does it say he did? He reasoned. He entered into dialogue with these people. He started sharing and a synagogue with the Jews was very much a place where everybody would contribute and they would ask. It wasn't a one-way, one-way thing. It was a back and forth. And this is what has happened in America is this breakdown in our cancel culture where people have stopped talking to each other. We've stopped talking to our neighbors. We've stopped talking to people we see at lunch. We've stopped talking and we're staring at our phones and the enemy wants to isolate isolate us and when we see the need spiritually you got to start engaging people saying hey how are you doing are you okay we got to break out of that spiritual box how many of you know it's spiritual there is a strategy against this world against this nation right now to isolate you we need each other we need the power of God therefore he reasoned in the synagogue So the first thing he did, he began speaking the truth of the gospel. He began speaking the truth of the gospel. 
The gospel is so powerful that when we share it, it releases a supernatural force. And you are not required to be successful. You are only required to be faithful. I'm going to say that again. You are not required to be successful. You are only required to be what? Faithful. A faithful witness. Who is it that brings the increase? Yeah, it's the Lord. But our part is sharing the good news. So all of this was taking place. And I see this, this so real for all of us. I was coming in. We were coming back uh, just the other day. We are flying into LAX. And coming down, you know how it is, you're coming down Century Boulevard. And there I see, I see, man, the first thing I notice, there's palm trees. No palm trees in Oklahoma. Did you know that? <laughs> and then I look just beyond, and there's the beach. I can see the Southern California beach and the tall buildings. And there, I look below the plane, and there's SoFi Stadium. It's like, man, we were coming into such a sophisticated culture, such a, a high-tech culture, so advanced, so knowledgeable, so sophisticated, and so very much spiritually in darkness. They don't know the truth. Here in Athens... They knew about the creation, but they had no knowledge of the creator. This is what's happening in America right now. It so reflects what, what was happening in Athens. Look at me in verse, verse uh, 18. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. So he's gone out. He reasoned with the, the Jews in the synagogue, the Gentile worshipers. Now he's outside. He's doing street evangelism. He's in the marketplace and he's talking to people. He comes across these Epicureans and the Stoics, the philosophers. The Epicureans were basically like the crowd that is, uh, you know, the pot smoking video game playing. If it feels good, do it. How many of you know what I mean? Okay. So the Epicureans believed, they believed there were gods, but they didn't believe that gods were involved in the lives of human humans or cared about them at all. So their motto was, hey, if you're going to have a good time, you need to have a good time now. So they were all about fun, fun, fun. If it feels good, do it. Have a good time. Do you know anybody like this in your life? Amen? Yeah? It's so similar to Southern California. It's, it's crazy. And the Epicureans, they were kind of couch potatoes. They were just, they wanted to avoid pain. They wanted to grab the gusto, have a good time, eat, drink, and be merry. But they didn't want to, they weren't into any discipline. The Stoics were the exact opposite group. The Stoics were like the aerobics instructors of that day. Very disciplined. We're going to overcome through discipline. They believed in the discipline in life. They were the first people to coin that phrase, mind over matter. The Stoics were people that believed that life was about enduring pain, about putting up, about being self-sufficient, about being able to stand alone. And so he runs into these two different philosophies. One, you need to enjoy your life, and one, you need to endure life. But neither of them understood eternal life. See, in Greece, here is what they believed. They believed in this dualism in Athens. They believed that things of the spirit were good and things of the physical, material, are evil. So it was very difficult for them to wrap their head around the message of the resurrection, that Christ died and rose from the dead. Because their thinking is, why would somebody who's purely spirit want to re-embrace the physical? So it was a, there was a dichotomy there. It was very difficult for the Athenians to get a hold of. And look what it says here in verse 18. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? This is a direct insult to Paul. They're saying, you don't even know what you're talking about. You're like a little bird, this word babbler, that picks up seed and you hear other people say stuff and you just repeat it. So um, look with me in ver the, the next portion. Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, 
May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean, for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. An idle babbler being taken before the Oropagus. Look at this picture with me because you can see the proximity here uh, of, of this uh, place, the Oropagus. The Oropagus was the city, if we can put that on the screen, um, the Oropagus is a city that is a place where the city council would meet, basically. It was the council of education and religion. They were like the elite of that day, and if there was a new philosophy, you had to go there, a new message. Do we have that picture? Okay. Trust me, it's amazing. <laughs> okay, close your eyes, I'm going to describe it. There's a smaller rock in front of the bigger rock. It was a rock about 30 to 40 feet tall. The city council would stay on this, this council of education and religion, because they understood that those two go together. And if you're introducing a new religious philosophy, that is linked with education. How many of you know it is very difficult to separate religion and education? Can I hear an amen? If you teach a generation of kids that they were, they were created, we came from nothing. We evolved out of the slime, right? We, we evolved out of the slime. We completely by chance. There's no meaning in your life. How many of you know if you teach your kid they came from slime for a generation, they're going to start acting slimy? You hear what I'm saying? So they knew education and religion go together. Hey, you ever hear of the one-room schoolhouse in America? Little Red Schoolhouse? You know what their number one book was for curriculum? It's the Bible. That's history, okay? That's American history right there. Because they understood these two, your worldview and your religion goes together. Part of the challenge in America right now is finding common ground for everybody to be on the same page. Am I telling the truth? Okay, I'm just speaking the truth here. So the Apostle Paul, these two philosophers, take him and now he's t technically almost like under arrest, he's being taken to the Oropagus, this hill named after Mars Hill or Ares, the god of war. And he's taken down there, and they're going to listen to him. They want to hear what is this philosophy, and they're going to let him know if it's okay to, to share this in the public place. And so the Apostle Paul gets there, and when he gets there, he has a perfect opportunity. While it could look like he's in trouble, he has the perfect witnessing opportunity. Some of you feel like maybe you've been in trouble. It is a divine setup by God for him to promote your witness so other people hear the good news. You're not in trouble. You're in an opportunity for God. Can I hear an amen, right? What did Paul do? We know that something has to happen. There has to be this sense in us spiritually where we are provoked to speak up. But what did the Apostle Paul do? What was his strategy? The Apostle Paul made known the unknown. He made known the unknown. He started with common ground. The Apostle Paul had been walking through the city. He'd been looking at the buildings. He saw all these different altars and he started observing what these people are like. If you want to know how to witness to somebody, how to share your faith, how many of you know you need to know something about that person, right? And when you know about them, what we say, talk to God about your neighbor before you talk to your neighbor about God. Can I hear an amen, right? Take them to the Lord. Start praying. Ask them. Start finding out what they're like. Be in a relationship with them. Be in a conversation with them. Start finding out where they're at. And that is the gateway for sharing the good news. Not anonymous. Not distant. In their face. And what that means is God will use you in a powerful way. Look with me in verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Oropagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. 
Here's what the Apostle Paul did not stay. He didn't stand and say, you stupid hillbilly Athenians. <laughs> you, are, you are dumber than a rock. You know what I saw? I saw all these different things. No, you know what he said? He said, I see that in all things you are very religious. Does that sound like a compliment or an insult? Yeah, they're probably, they're probably taking it as a compliment. You've got to build rapport with the person. You have to see something in them. Man, I love the way I see you interact with your kids. I think that's so awesome, right? So you're asking about it. You're learning about them. And then you're, and then you're, 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 you're finding po something positive to build on. Look with me in verse 23. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Verse 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times as the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of you, your own poets, have said, for we are also his offspring." Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Lord. And in this message, one of the most powerful presentations of the gospel, you read through this, and one of the most powerful presentations is in two minutes. And some of you are thinking to yourself, Pastor Steve, why can't your sermons be two minutes? <laughs> to that I would say because I am not indeed the Apostle Paul. How many of you know you're getting a summary? You're getting a summary. You're getting a summary. Look what he did. He starts with the common ground. He starts by building, by building common ground. He starts by affirming them. I see that men of Athens, you're a religious, you are religious in all things. He's building rapport. And then he moves on to what they know. They know the unknown God. They know there's a, a, an altar to that, but they don't know who he is. He starts on the common ground. And this is how we share our witness effectively. Remember, when he's in the synagogue with the Jews, he starts with the scriptures. And then he moves to Jesus. When he is talking to the secular mind, he's talking to an individual, does not know God, not a God-fearer. He starts where they're at and runs straight to Jesus. How many think that's a good strategy for sh sharing your faith, right? So there's only one gospel. The gospel is the same in China, in Russia, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in, in the United States, in South America. There's only one gospel. How many of you know the presentation of the gospel is as different as the individual you're sharing with, right? When I talk to my grandkids, I, and I'm sharing the faith with them, I'm reading a Bible story, Man, I'm getting into it. It is story time theater. I'm making every animal noise, right? I'm, I'm acting this thing out. Kids are hiding behind their pillows, you know? I mean, I'm getting down with the kids because I'm sharing faith with a kid. When you're dealing with a secular mindset, you start on common ground and you head toward Jesus. You head toward Jesus. Look in this message. He starts with how God is the creator 
He's the great God, the creator of everything. He ends with how God is the judge. He talks about how there's this day coming where we'll give an account and God has been patient. And this, this verse 24 through 29, he describes who God is. He's describing this unknown God that you don't even know who he is. I wanna tell you who he is. He's Jesus, the risen son of God. And then in verse 30, he begins... 30 and 31, he begins to tell them what they must do. He gives them a clear course of action. And the Apostle Paul is able to be orthodox without being obnoxious. Amen? He is able to be uncompromising without being unkind. He is bold. He is not harsh. He finds a way to build that relational equity, and he shares and this powerful, powerful message is given to these intellectual elites. And this is the thing. Even the smartest people in the world, they can be brilliant in one area and completely ignorant in another. They can know. It's amazing the background. When you, you, you know how this is Father's Day. You know how many people are raised without a dad? It is staggering. It is staggering how many guys either had a bad dad or no dad at all. And I want to say thank you to all the spiritual fathers in Canyon Hills, the men's ministry, <laughs> being dads to young men, reaching out. God bless you. But people have this innate knowledge. There's a God-shaped hole in people. There's this vacuum. They know. I've tried everything else. They're trying to fill this hole with drugs, with alcohol, with, with accomplishment, with my career goals, with my, my materialistic. And they're sticking all these things in. And they begin realizing none of this, none of this is what is filling this hole. Because God wants them to have an intimate relationship with him. And you are the one who can build a bridge from where they are to the truth of the gospel. You, you are the one that can be used in such a powerful way. Everybody has a knowledge there has to be more. Tonight in Bakersfield, there will be countless people who lay their heads on their pillows and they're gonna be thinking to themselves, there has, there has to be more. Has, I know there's more. I know there's more than what I'm experiencing. Oh, and there's a real God who loves them so much that he sent his only son to be sacrificed so that they could be in relationship with God the Father. You talk about a Father's Day message. He is our heavenly Father. Oh. Won't you be one of the reconcilers that brings people who are so afraid of God, so afraid of what he might say or what they've done that they can't be forgiven and show them the overwhelming love of God that he loved them so much. Shining light on the darkness. Look at verse 32. And when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius, the Arapagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So even one of them on the council stepped down and said, said to Paul, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. It was only a few. But how many of you know the value of one soul is worth more than everything in the world. How many of you believe that God has some divine appointments for you? That he's going to put you in a place where you can speak up and you can bring the truth in darkness. When was the last time you felt provoked? You felt an urgency, I've got to share. I've got to share with this person. What is it that you're seeing in your friends' and family's lives? Because I know this, there's a lost world that needs Jesus Christ. And you are the best hope. 
There are some people, if it's not you, they will never hear. They'll never hear. You walk through the streets of Athens in the first century, and these idols that are everywhere, tens of thousands of idols, tens of thousands of altars, they were very ornate. We have some of them in the museums. Great intricate carvings, great design. Somebody spent lots of time fashioning these altars to display that false god. And some would look at it and say, what a beautiful thing, what a beautiful piece of art. But in the Old Testament, God said, when you make the altar to me, make it an unhewn altar. Make it of rock that you don't even touch. You don't put a design on it. You don't make it ornate. You just let it be plain and simple. It's going to not look like much, but that altar is not where the glory is. The altar, the glory is in the God of heaven, God Almighty. And anything that you would do to decorate this altar would not do justice to the holiness, to the beauty, to the glory of God Almighty. It's the exact opposite of a false God's altar. And it gives me tremendous hope. Because sometimes you just don't feel like, you know what I mean? You're all that. You know what I'm saying, right? How many times have you not shared your faith? Because you just, I'm just not quite, you know, there's someone better. There's someone that looks better, that talks better. There's somebody that, that can do it better. The real God of heaven doesn't use the religiously ornate. He uses the simple. He uses the one that maybe looks rough and kind of earthy and like not real flashy because when God speaks through that person that is just a down-to-earth, common, everyday person, everyone goes, wow, God is amazing because there's no way they could do that. I'm feeling something right now, and I don't, this, this guy that's sharing to me is so simple. He doesn't know much at all, but I feel the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's got to be a God in heaven. How many of you know? I want to ask you to stand up, because we're going to commit ourselves to God right now. The challenge this morning is this. What do you see when you look at people? Are you seeing the outside or are you seeing their spirit? Have you felt provoked lately? When's the last time you felt you needed to share your witness? If that's not there, then that's a heart condition. We gotta get closer to God. If you're here and you would say, if the Lord put someone in my path that needed to know him, I would be willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. I want you to raise your hand right now. If you're saying that, you're raising your hand to God. I know some, you're afraid. You're an unhewn altar. Hold your hand in the air. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you see every hand that's up right now. Oh God, as I look at these people, I know there are divine appointments that you've already orchestrated. Spiritual assignments, God, that you have for them. Lord, there's someone in their life that doesn't know you. There's someone in their life that is headed for an eternity in hell. God, today, would you provoke us, God, to share our faith? Would your spirit rise up in us where we would not be able to contain it, Lord, where we would begin to share in Holy Spirit as you prompt us, every person that's here, God, I pray that even this week, you are going to give them a supernatural divine appointment, God, someone who is lost, that they can share the good news of Jesus Christ with. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit's gonna quicken them now. You're gonna begin preparing them. Lord, you're gonna cause them to start calling out to you for that moment this week, Lord. 
And God, we thank you for the harvest that is going to take place as a result of this. And we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Let's give God a hand clap. Oh, man, such a powerful opportunity. Now, listen, if you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want to tell you, Jesus is coming again. He made that promise. I want you to be ready for his return. At the end of this service, our prayer leader is going to be up here. If you've never put your full faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, any one of them will be up here ready to lead you to the Lord, pray the sinner's prayer with you, welcome you into the family of God. Church, God's got something awesome for us. Aren't you thankful for all he's done? Let's give God a tremendous hand clap. Thank you for joining us today at Canyon Hills. We hope the Holy Spirit spoke to you through this message and our prayer is that your heart was touched and forever changed. We believe God's word is true and it is life changing. So if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to stay up to date on all the things happening here. That way you'll always be in the know when we post new messages, videos from Canyon Hills worship, and when we're live during Sunday and Wednesday services. If you're new to Canyon Hills, we'd love to learn more about you and how we can pray for you and serve you well. You can click the link in the video notes or text NEXT to 661-387-3131 for all the ways to connect here at Canyon Hills. We hope you have a blessed day and we'll see you next time.